someone dies? Like, really? Between these pages, one of these six characters dies. Hi, my name is Sean Wood. I am the creator of The Fog Within. We are live on Kickstarter with issue three until September 20th. You can find me at Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok under Sean Wood underscore writer. And we are on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. He is athletic because that's the basis of this particular comic. He is also a very talented comic writer in his own right with the potential of this being a 12-issue series called The Fog With It. We're joined by the ever-talented Sean Wood. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's great to have you. You know, I, I saw the comic, got to read the first two issues, got me excited about issue three. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead of myself here as I normally do. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Yeah, so The Fog Within is my first series I've ever written. Uh, I've been working on it about a year and a half now, and uh, we're on issue three. It is a cataclysmic event happens in, in the present. Uh, three days later, Hunter, our average go, uh, Joe character, uh, all of a sudden is running and falls into this fog. He's all of a sudden 26 years in the future, doesn't know how he got there. Uh, and there's chaos. It's dystopian at this point. Uh, the world around him does not look the same anymore. And as the reader and as the main character, we're both finding together uh, what's going on and learning about this, uh, this new future. So it's a, it's a wild ride. It's a lot of 90s over-the-top yeah. action. Uh, you've got rebels. You've got dystopia future sci-fi stuff. Uh, you've got a regime in place, of course, that doesn't treat the, everyone right. And uh, a lot of, lot of fun. It almost feels like we're like living in the now right now in our current world. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, sometimes, you know? yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, what's the most unusual or un unexpected source of inspiration you drew from to create The Fog Within? Yeah, so I got the first idea, uh, go figure, when I was running. Uh, I'm a, I was training for a marathon at the time. It was a foggy day, hence the fog. <laughs> and uh, I just thought, had this random thought, you know, I'm, you know running for like an hour like you will. And just if I went through this fog, if I ended up somewhere else, all of a sudden, what would it look like? And my mind couldn't stop wandering after that. And a year and a half later, I'm still working on that idea. Being a first time comic writer, or at least a mm -hmm. creator of comics here, you know, why did you want to use this particular medium? I've grown up with comics my entire life. I was pretty much born into it. My dad's collected since the 60s, all the way to mid 90s. He had every issue you could possibly think of. Uh, and sometimes three uh, copies of it because, you know, everything's going to be worth money in the future. Uh, so I could read any of that. And I pretty much the first thing I would read growing up learning how to read was was comics. Um, the kid comics like Batman Adventures, you know, when that animated series was coming out in the early 90s. And then just everything X-Men, 70s, 80s. Um, and then, of course, Image when that was first coming out. I was reading Spawn way too early. <laughs> I was like five or so, uh, looking at Spawn, just being in awe of Todd McFarland and, oh, yeah. and that whole world. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I've always been obsessed. I, I always love movies and shows and, and books as well, but comics has definitely been my, my passion growing up. I've, I've told everybody, my, my middle name is Logan because Wolverine. Uh, my dad told my mom that after it was on the paperwork, uh, but I was pretty much told I had to be a nerd or else, you know, uh, and I'm okay with that. Uh, and now it's the cool thing. Everybody's doing it, you know, because of the MCU and all that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that's where I get all that from. You better not become a doctor or enjoy science <laughs> right. or anything like that. You better become a nerd. It's you have to know all the facts of the X-Men. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like that, that one short video you saw. It's like, what are you watching? Star Wars. Which kind? It's the prequels. <laughs> it's great to see. Like, I, I love the fact that you had uh, you know, parents that encourage your geekiness, that encourage you to, you know, think outside the box. I think that's the most important thing about not necessarily being a nerd, but being passionate about what you are into, because yeah. at least you can talk with anyone in some way, shape or form. They may not like the same things as you, but at least you can hold a conversation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My dad. 
I mean, we still talk to this day more about nerd stuff than like real life stuff, really. <laughs> it's like, hey, did you see that episode of this? Or hey, did you read that? Or, you know, whatever. Um, it's it's funny because my mom's not like that at all. Uh, she does not understand nerd stuff whatsoever. And neither does my wife. So when my, me and my dad get together, they're like, oh, Lord, they're their own language. We have no idea what's going on. If you had to choose one daily habit that, that's been crucial to your creative process for this comic, what would it be and why? Hmm. Um, well, I would like to say that I'm writing on a daily basis, but that's hard with a family and full-time job and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I am always in the back of my mind thinking about what I can add to the story or how I can change this page that we're about to get to with the art and uh, things of that nature. I'm always, my mind's always wandering in that, that uh, arena, I guess. So it's not always being able to put it down on paper, but always thinking about how I can add and, and change the dialogue in this one page or just anything I can possibly think of. It's, it's just always in my mind. So you don't have like a notepad beside your bed or something like that, where you just bolt up at night and start writing things down. Nothing like that. I do, but not on a daily basis though. Okay. Uh, I do have like a, a notebook at, at work that, you know, if I, if I have like a random thought, just randomly real quick, you know, write something at my desk um, and things of that nature, but not on a daily basis though. That's what we'll have plenty of aha moments though, for sure. You gotta say that's what meetings are for, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception people have about creating a post-apocalyptic comic? Hmm. Post-apocalyptic specifically. Um, I mean, one thing that, that I like about being post-apocalyptic is that the sandbox is is much bigger. Uh there's nothing set in stone there's no history involved already because it's the future so it could be anything um there's different kinds of post apocalypse of course um it could be uh, you know better technology or it could be desert land uh you know things of that nature so um i don't know if it's a misconception but i would say there's plenty to choose from you make it your own uh, there's not history involved in, in on it so it's it's not one set way, I guess. Freedom, freedom to be creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's kind of good, you know, in a sense that, and I mean, there's a lot of inspiration when it comes to post-apocalyptic comics. I mean, you got Walking Dead, the zombie post-apocalyptic genre there in that respect. Right. And then you have Mad Max and you have other uh, aspects in that respect. And there's there's a lot of great content overall uh, that, that we have all loved and enjoyed. So a oh, yeah. uh, lot to pull from for sure. If you could only use three tools or resources to create your next comic, what would they be and why? Hmm. Um, that is a tough question. Mm -hmm. Definitely need, uh, you know, Photoshop or things of that nature. That's definitely a huge tool. Uh, I guess I would say my brain, because that would be, mm -hmm. you know, a tool. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty big one <laughs> yep. for a cohesive story. Uh, and, uh, third one, I would just say, uh, my artist's hands, um, because his penciling and inking is insane. And this book would not be what it is without, without his hands. So that'd be the three tools. <laughs> nice. That, that actually leads into my next question. Who is your team around mm -hmm. the fog within and how did you find them and why did you choose them? So David Dion is my penciler and inker and uh, my colorist is Josh Rodriguez and uh, my letterer and uh, designer of the book is uh, Justin with letter squids. And we've been together since the, the first book, actually. So uh, the way I found them was through uh, Facebook. So I've tried different things like uh, Twitter, you know, Pro Portfolio Day and um, different um, hashtags. And um, I've looked at Reddit um, and things of that nature. But uh, there's this one Facebook group that is constantly going and it's connecting writers and artists and, and teams. And um, I just scoured that for like a month and a half or so. Uh, when I first started out after I had, you know, like a, a broad script, I didn't have whether it was full script or Marvel way, things of that nature. Didn't know what the artist wanted yet. Um, so I had, I had the basis and then, uh, yeah, I looked for the team. My first thing was definitely looking for the penciler. Um, I knew I wanted to try to do the traditional routes. Um, digital is great too. I read plenty of books that have digital artists, but I just love that, that old school way of pen to paper. Um, and pencil to paper. And um, 
yeah, so I found him. Uh, we started talking, and uh, after I had uh, David on on board, then I could find um, everything else for the book, and it just meshed together real well. Uh, didn't know what I was doing for sure when I first started, and uh, he helped me along the way because he does it full time. This is all he does. He does uh, typically two books um, at a time, and um, what I didn't know or what I had I had a question about, he was more than welcome to to help me out because he liked the idea of the book and. And wanted to do well, and and we're continuing on after uh, even this issue to to issue four together. So it's been a crazy ride for sure. So what did you learn about this creative process that you didn't realize? So I was very naive, of course, not knowing. Um, I barely even knew about Kickstarter actually uh, to begin with. Um, so if Kickstarter wasn't a thing, I wouldn't be doing this because I can't afford to to do it on my own uh, for the whole process. Um, so that was the, the biggest thing. And then what I didn't know was for one, it's like, oh, I'm going to make a comic. Nobody's doing this. I'll make thousands of dollars immediately. Um, and I'm glad I had that mentality starting out because it would have probably scared me to not do it if I knew that how hard it was going to be. <laughs> um, but now that we you know, have you know, two books already in hand and almost done with the third one, um, I wouldn't change it for the world. So I'm glad I'm glad I was naive in that sense. Um, but yeah, every day, that first book, every day I was learning something new when I needed to learn it, exactly the time I needed to. Um, it was rough, but, uh, but now I have you know, a sense of what's going on and, and uh, everyone around me has helped in that aspect. We just keep on going and now we're just having a lot of fun. So then what are three things you actually learned that you can pass on to people that are just starting out? So when I first started, I didn't have an indie scene around me for one um, that's been huge um, the community yeah there can be some drama but there's also a lot of really cool guys that that want to help everyone out um, and i've found those guys that if i have any questions i can go to them i'm in different groups on facebook and i've met some of them in person at cons and just talked to a lot of them outside of the cons um, so that would be the first thing was finding that indie scene to have that support um, second thing is um actually been huge is like comics launch uh podcast with uh, tyler james yep, yep. um listening to that all the time especially that first year every week learning of what to do and how to uh, market it better and everything that was huge and then um just understanding what my team needs for me uh what i'd say would be the third one um so like i said you know, starting out, I didn't know what the artist would want to do. I heard in different classes that they uh, a lot of times want all of the um, the ideas, but they don't want the full scripts. They want to be able to figure out how to do the paneling and everything on themselves. Uh, but of course, some artists, uh, they want the full script and they want specifics on everything and whatever I'm saying they want to put um, in the drawing or the, the coloring or whatever. Um, and they, they want me to have control. So, and I'm completely fine with that. Uh, either way, uh, I just wanted whatever my team wanted from me. What was the most radical experiment you conducted in your storytelling for The Fog Within? So one of the pages that I have on this third Kickstarter um, is a, I don't even know what to call it, honestly. It's a side um, two-page spread, I guess uh, you would call it. So that way you actually have to flip the book over. Um, so I didn't, I've done two page spreads on each issue and I have one, a regular one in the third issue as well. So there's this one page that was so dramatic in the, the sense of what it is that I want to do something different. So I heard um, Scott Snyder talk a couple of times about this one issue of Batman when he was doing it, with the new 52. And it was like issue six or seven. And it makes you like spiral the whole way through when he's with the court of the owls and you like, you have to turn it as it goes. So I just had that in my mind and it's not that dramatic. Um, I could get to that at some point maybe uh, with the story, but uh, at least I want to do something different and a little more dramatic than what I was already doing. And I just want to always try to push uh, the limit and uh, we'll see. I think it's going to turn out great. I can't wait to see that. That would be interesting. What lesson have you learned about world building in comics? So you definitely don't want to have, for world building, I wanted to have the idea of everything that I could possibly add to the story uh, for the world in the first issue and just get all your thoughts out completely because 
it can tangle you up pretty quick if you have, you know, hey, this would be a cool, cool idea for issue one, but then you get to the third issue and the story it doesn't make sense of where they are or, um, you know, something changes and you have to explain it. And there's a lot of dialogue just to explain this one thing that makes it cohesive. That's not what you, you want to do. You want the, the art to speak for itself. Um, so that was my biggest thing with world building was definitely have the idea of the broad world out in the in the first issue and then just expand on it from there. Sometimes you can get really bogged down with exposition as well, too. And the fact that you have, you know, you're a writer, you're trying to kind of hold yourself back, but you still want to explain everything. Like, how do you find that right. balance? So especially starting out for the first issue, that was very difficult. Because I don't like exposition in comics. Uh, I want, like I said, I want the art to speak for itself. And that's what they all say. You want to do less words. You still want to have dialogue, of course, and um, and have a story. But they're there in the comic world, reading the comic because they like the whole experience. Um, And I can never do a Brian Michael Bendis type of thing. He's he's good at that, but um, I I can never do that for for myself. Uh, But actually, one thing I learned in one of his classes was uh, he was proud about Fino. I don't even know how to say it. Phenomena, I guess. Oh, Phenomena. Yeah, I guess that's how you'd say it. But yeah, book one and two. So the book one, the like third page, um, it's talking about pomegranate. That's one of his newer books. He just had issue two come out. So a graphic novel. But um, he said um, in one scene, pomegranate. They talked about pomegranate. And that's how you knew they were on Earth still. It was just in the future. Uh, versus him explaining this is earth this year and blah 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 uh, at the beginning of the intro um, he said pomegranate so you knew this was hey this was a plant you know a food on earth you're on earth let's keep going um, so that was always in my mind starting out is try to do that kind of um, expedition the, the less is is better okay. and um, actually i met him at uh, baltimore comic-con last mm-hmm. year and uh, I brought the book that I brought was book one and had him sign that page. And uh, actually, when I met him, I don't know why I was tongue tied, but I could barely get a sentence out saying I'm on my first Kickstarter right now, because, partly because of your class. And I want you to sign this page because of this class. And uh, he just smiled at me. He's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the, the whole time, and I was like, I got one sentence out. I'm Kickstarter. <laughs> and he's like cool how's it going and i was like it's going like this and he's like oh it should be fine you're doing great uh, it looks great you know and he was really cool about it so it was nice that being tongue-tied it wasn't a big deal it could have made me feel pretty dumb but uh it didn't happen so that was nice. great <laughs> yeah I, but it's those types of interactions that kind of really stick with you it, it's just oh, yeah. you know you, you get those those people you admire they're whether they're mentors whether they're just people you you admire from afar and and it's really those positive interactions that just stick with you uh, more so than maybe one of your idols that are negative or mean to you type mm-hmm. thing. It's it oh, just yeah. it gets you through the day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, last year I went to basically five or six uh, comic cons in my area, like three hours away um, from where I live, just to try to meet some indies. Of course, try to meet um, the people that I like that I've I've read their stuff. And um, just show what I could, if they'd be willing to to look at it. I got advice from indie guys, um, and some of the guys that I met, um, indie from the indie scene, have helped me out a lot and put me in different groups and really helped me start where I'm at now, uh, which has been great. But um, like who? But, oh, um, well, in the indie scene, um, Travis Gibb has been oh yeah huge. Awesome. Um, Timothy Fling, uh, those two guys were my uh, my biggest uh, helps. Uh, he does Water Wars. Um, a couple other things, uh, but yeah, those guys have been great, and we're in different groups uh, together, discords, um, and stuff like that. I've been on both their shows plenty of times now, um, and found shows from them as well. So yeah, um, but on the the regular side, like the the big names, uh, definitely the biggest one that's helped me is uh, Scott Snyder, mm-hmm. which has been really cool. Um, Scott Snyder, I'm in his class as well, and. Um, I met him in Baltimore last year too. Baltimore was huge actually for me. Um, And uh, he has where you can meet once a month with him. And um, I'm in that tier now. So we've been meeting since uh, I think last October, once a month, Mm -hmm. about five minutes or so. And he's been huge helping with scripts, 
helping me um, get a, a pitch ready to possibly, you know, give it to a publisher. Um, and also doing the anthology work, trying to get into that scene as well. So it's, it's been great. And he's, he's so down to earth and uh, I don't know how he has time with everything that's going on right now and in his world, whether it's shows or um, the, the class in general, whether it's, you know, the DC stuff that's coming up in like a month uh, that he's pretty much in charge of. It's insane. Um, there was actually one time I was meeting with him and uh, we had to uh, postpone the, uh, the meeting because he also had a flight that happened. And then I found out uh, later is because he was on set at Superman, the movie. Huh. And uh, so he had to cancel our meeting because he had to fly to California to see Superman. It's oh, like, oh, I oh, see how no. it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a shame. So, yeah, yeah. So I was like, that's okay. I can wait a couple of days to, to talk to Scott about my comic versus him seeing on set of a movie. You know, it's cool. <laughs> Did you take photos, Scott? Just saying. Yeah. Like, like, at least show us that to show us you were actually right. on set and didn't blow right. us off. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all good. The one person I always regret, I never... See, I got to see an interview, Neil Adams, briefly. Um, a couple of times, uh, nice. and his sons as well. His sons are extremely talented too. Like just not, not only in comics, but in models and things like that. So I think I interviewed three out of his four sons, which yeah. was, which was interesting anyhow, but Neil, Neil had a, a lot of great advice and experience and all that stuff. That was fun, but, but I never got to interview Stanley. That was my, that was my oh, yeah. regret, unfortunately, but, um, I would have yeah. liked to have gotten to him earlier <laughs> in his, in his career. Right. I saw him um, at, I think it was uh, Pittsburgh or Philly. I think it was a Philly con. And Stan Lee was meeting people and I had him sign, uh, what was it? The big uh, Amazing Spider-Man was supposed to be over at that time. Mm -hmm. I guess it was 750 or something like that. There was like a, a whole cover of just Spider-Man is like a collage of different Spider-Man inside of a Spider-Man's face. I had him sign that. And, uh, and I took a picture with him and it was great. And he was, he was, you know, running around pretty quick for an older guy back then. Um, that was probably like 10 years ago, something like that. But, uh, yeah, it was really cool to, to be able to see Stanley. Didn't talk to him too much or anything, but, uh, just being in his presence was, was awesome. Uh, absorb his creativity through osmosis and through the yeah. air. You know? <laughs> All of a sudden I wanted to yell Excelsior. <laughs> <laughs> I you got know. to see him briefly. I was at uh, Motor City Comic Con, and by briefly, I mean quite literally, like ten seconds worth of the side door burst open. Four of the largest men I've ever seen <laughs> whisked uh, a Stan Lee out uh, into a uh, an air conditioned van, and he goes, "Thanks for coming out, true believers." And <laughs> and he That's and he awesome. got got dro driven away. My cameraman had his lens cap on, got the tail end of like, yeah. So I, I had to fire him after that, but oh geez. <laughs> he got the tail end of Stanley driving away. Didn't even get like a photo. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, oh man. man, what's the most unusual ritual or superstition you've developed while working on the fog within? So I would say a superstition that I was trying to start on my own and it didn't work out well was using a, uh, a fancier ink pen uh, to write with. Uh, I saw an interview with uh, Neil Gaiman uh, that he has this certain pen that he uses when he writes. Mm -hmm. uh, he has certain notebooks too, but I like the idea of, you know, the, the fountain ink pen and everything. And it didn't work out too well. The, the one that I got that uh, I don't know if he suggested or not, but I got, it was like 20 bucks. It kind of blew up on my hand. Oh. Um, so that, that didn't, uh, that didn't last very long. That was a ritual I was trying to start. I was going to always write with that ink pen, you know, as I started. But um, I would say one that I actually am uh, using. Oh, man, it's tough. I really don't have a ritual. I have whenever the kids are asleep and I have a chance to write and sit down and, and process what I'm thinking about for the book is, is my, uh, my go-to. So I guess that would be a ritual. My kids are in bed. That's when I write. There you go. I found that's, it. That's good. That, that, yeah. That see, that's that's productive and creative, and it gets gets your thoughts out on the page, and you'll probably sleep better. You know, whether or not oh, you yeah. snore, that's a different story. But, you know, <laughs> as as long yeah, as true. you get it out of your head and onto a page, it's one less thing you have to worry about, and you can move on. Yep. 
Oh yeah. And I don't forget that, that <laughs> mind block, that, that great, like explosive. Ha ha. Um, I will never lose it. Cause it'll be on paper somewhere. If you could choose a completely different medium other than comics to tell the fog within, what would it be and how would you adapt it? So I would say I would not be there to get it prose. So it wouldn't be prose. Um, I would say probably if I had the resources and the money and everything like that uh, and the time would be a, a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I mean, shows, movies, I, I, I could eat that up all day long, every day. Um, especially when it's shorter shows, like, you know, 10 episodes type of seasons. Um, it just gets the story out better, I think. So either a show or a movie, uh, for sure. Um, how I would adapt it. Um, I, it's not that I, I think of it when I'm writing, but I feel like it would run smoothly as um, maybe a mini series would probably be best. So if it if I get to the the full twelve issues, it'd be a mini series. It'd be twelve twelve episodes. So I'd be able to adapt it that way. I think would be would be well. So basically, an an episode of comic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is something that I've, I've talked to other creators for. You don't have to have a large budget to do what you're doing. You literally could just, I mean, local universities, drama departments, you know, things like that. Make a short film. You already have, you know, with your phone. Yeah. Like a better camera than, you know, a lot of other stuff that you could just pick up for, for cash. You could just film it on that. True. But just make a short, short concept. A proof of concept, a five minute, a five minute short for your first issue. Something simple to the point that hits your key highlights of your comic will draw more interest than, you know, making an entire series. So you could use that as a pitch to also your publishers too. Hey, I have this other thought process for this. You could be on the starting block for, you know, publishing this potential multimedia series. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. (laughs) Especially nowadays with cameras. I mean, back, I actually was trying to be a wedding photographer 15 years ago or so. Nice. Um, I decided to go the route of a steady paycheck instead um, <laughs> of that. Uh, but I did it for about a year. And um, back then you had to have all the fancy everything. And yeah, technology has definitely gone a long way since then. So that's true. Let's talk about the main cast and who would you have acting as those particular roles for your new amazing series yeah uh so hunter is our main character uh he's the one that falls into this fog and ends up in the future uh he's a runner uh i would love to say hmm, who would be him pretty much i just want to say ryan reynolds but that didn't really fit just everything deadpool and everything um but uh i don't know it could be just anybody athletic um with spiky hair that's really all he needs to have to start out with um and then uh damon he's my uh, my big bad uh in the series uh he's in the present as well as the uh, the future he's the one that's uh the ruling leader um he also has um this this power um from the fog that we start to learn about a little bit um he's this cool like punk looking dude with like a red vest like cape um with some armor uh he's got kind of like a half of his head shaved um longer hair on the side uh, there's a white streak um i really have not thought about this of who would <laughs> who would be these characters uh but somebody that would bring that presence of uh, punk rock, uh, but, uh, you know, badass type of, um, it don't mess with me type. Um, and then I've got this whole, uh, cast of, of great characters, uh, the rebel side, yeah. uh, there's these elite rebels, uh, they have all, uh, nicknames, uh, they don't go by their names anymore. And, uh, they go by alpha, um, Zeta, Epsilon. Uh, those are the, the main, uh, elite rebels. So once they're that elite status, they don't go by their name anymore. They just go by that. Kind of had like a Bad Batch feel to it mm-hmm. or um, maybe a G.I. Joe type of idea um, behind it. The reason why I did those names too was 
this world, a lot of the adults have been infected that was in the present. And 26 years later, a lot of the adults, they're, they're gone. You don't know what happened to them. They're missing. Um, so these, um, these rebels, they were kids back when all this started and they don't have the adults in their lives. So they wanted to get away from that, um, that sense of things to the old world. So now they're going by these names. It kind of breaks them away from that, um, that family aspect from the, the old world. Um, so that's where I came up with those names. Um, but one guy, he's kind of like uh, Alpha. He's like the big bad. He's like an alpha male. Um, he's kind of like a Raphael type character. Uh, bigger dude. Um, Epsilon, she is a punk rocker in her own right. Um, and uh, she's athletic. She's a sniper. She's got blades. She's pretty cool. She's probably one of my favorite characters. Um I really have no idea who would play any of these characters, though. But they're great characters, though, for sure. I mean, oh, yeah. athletic woman, um, Zeta, he's younger. He's the technology guy. Um, he, he's um, like 10 years younger than everybody else, basically. So he's the smartest guy in the room um, type of, of character. Um, and those, are, those are the main characters. There's a lot of other villain-type characters, too, but that's like the main sense of all of them. I think Matt Willard would be a good uh, Damon. Yeah, get, nice. He has that SC Punk, you know, um, mm-hmm. style. He could easily pull it off again for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There nice. you go. P- pitch it to him. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and then you'll definitely get funding for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. If you could instantly master one new skill, new skill, to enhance your comic creation process, what would it be and why? Honestly, I, I've thought about trying to do um, some of the coloring myself where I know, understand the coloring better mm-hmm. um, just so I can help on that side. Like sometimes I know something is needed, but I don't know exactly what it is until we just keep on going with the conversation and figure out, hey, what about this change? What about this change? So I've thought about doing a class uh, to do the coloring side just so I understand exactly what he's going through and exactly what he needs. Um, yeah, just be more involved with the book. Um, like right now I'm, I'm somewhat in the background. I don't put it in the, um, uh, you know, the front of the book to say I am this, but I am like erasing the pencils. Um, so I'm, I'm the official eraser in the book, I guess, um, from the inks to the, the pencil since it's all uh, traditional. Uh, and then I give it to the colorist. So I'm starting in the smallest of small parts of that side of things and just seeing what all is involved and all the layers and. It just, it really interests me. I know I can never do the the penciling or the inking. That's definitely not my my thing. Um, I do uh, stick figures, so I could never, never get to that point right now. Um, but the coloring, though, could be something in the future that I could, could add to the book. So for me, I went back to university for, because I was in IT for 20 years, and I just got burnt out with the industry. Went back to university for visual arts and communication media and film. So oh, nice. fine art. Like yeah, yeah. 20 years in IT going into fine art just was completely <laughs> like just blew my mind. Yeah. Different so, part of the brain. <laughs> oh, completely. Yeah. It was just like, <laughs> uh, yeah. but the one thing I, I found interesting was learning color theory and learning color theory with lighting specifically. And I think that's something that if you're not into art or if you want to understand it better, Understanding the color wheel, understanding color theory in in comics, but understanding color theory in TV and film specifically will really kind of, I think, help you with your creative writing process as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You already you're already subconsciously seeing all of this stuff in the in the media you consume. Right. Understanding how light reacts with surfaces like Caravaggio specifically is is the perfect example of how do you understand light sources and shadow and i think Mm. if you want to understand from at least the base art perspective that would be a good you know take a walk in your local art museum figure out why the light and the color works well with particular paintings and you'll understand that a little better for your comic creation process yeah it's true yeah that's one thing that's changed since i started so of course i've always consumed you know shows and tv or shows and movies and everything but i didn't have that sense of Hey, how did they get to that point? How did they do, how did they go from A to B and how do they 
do separate storylines and break it apart. And now you know where you're in and the new scene and, and things of that nature. So now I'm, I've definitely seen myself breaking everything apart as I watch everything versus just enjoying it. Um, or seeing, like since I've been in these writing classes, seeing, oh, they're starting at this point. And now I know they're going to end up at this point because that's how the, the character is going to grow or, or what have you. And my wife thinks it's very annoying because like, I'm like, oh, this is going to happen. She's like, ah, oh, I hate you. Why'd you tell me that? kind of thing but uh but yeah it's it's definitely a different perspective um uh, writing now uh, versus just enjoying it what's yeah. the most surprising way the fog within has impacted your personal life or relationships outside of your work so i would say i i know i'm the the new guy and i know it's going to be a long process but i've actually been noticed um in my area twice now uh, which is so weird. Uh, they knew that I was the, the writer of the fog within. Um, so one time I was wearing the shirt and they said, Oh, I saw that comic, you know, at the little comic shop. Um, are you the writer? And I was like, Oh yeah, we had a conversation. That was really cool. Uh, that was the first time it happened. Second time, um, someone had to see my ID for something. I think I was trying to sell something at a uh, second and Charles or something like that. And they're like, are you the writer of the fog within? And I was like, how do you know that? Cause I, I just had my first two issues at the uh, couple of local comic shops in the area. And he's like, Oh, I saw your name. It was at the counter. And I just figured there's not too many Sean Woods out there. So it had to be you. And it was just, it, it made my day for sure. Uh, so that's how it's changed is a couple of times, not very many, but a couple of times I've been noticed in the area and it's, it's been really cool. Pretty soon you have to hire security to like uh, yeah, yeah. You down the comic convention aisles and push people away. And, the sunglasses sorry no paparazzi no paparazzi <laughs> <laughs> see you're you're getting into the character already i love it it's yeah, great. <laughs> exactly <laughs> everyone usually asks what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bs piece of advice you've ever received but what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your career the second wisest hmm i would say the thing that comes to mind is make sure you have an editor and make sure it's not someone that is a friend that's going to tell you everything is great. Um, because those guys mean well, but it's not beneficial to you as a writer or uh, your fan base if you're trying to make the story better and it's not getting better and doesn't make any sense because everyone's saying it's perfect. Don't change anything. Um, I see that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, I do have an editor. I've had an editor from the beginning. Um, they're an English major, not in comics, uh, but they're an English major. So that's helped out and they consume a lot of, of this type of, uh, world, the nerd stuff, the dystopian stuff. So, uh, and they'll tell me completely, like they are a friend, but they're also professional and they'll tell me this is stupid. You need to change this immediately, um, all day long. And they enjoy telling me that too. <laughs> so so which I'm fine with. I, I want the honest truth. I don't want someone to just say, hey, it's perfect. I don't need that. So what did they change that you're like, oh, man, really? <laughs> well, actually, the first thing that they changed was uh, Epsilon was going to be a dude at the beginning. Um, and then they're like, you need to have a more sense of, of family. You need to have this different perspective. And Epsilon is my favorite character now, uh, the way she is. And I, I wouldn't change it. Uh, for the world. So I'm glad that they, they brought that up. That was right at the beginning. That's probably the biggest thing they've changed. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh man. So language with my book is a little different too, because I don't have any uh, cursing in it. Um, I've kind of, I've been borderline of being for like teens and, and younger like kids, but also adults kind of like going back and forth with that. Uh, so there's no cursing. So language has definitely been harder thinking of, of different words to bring out emotion uh, versus just saying, you know, the F-bomb or, or whatever. Um, so, th I mean, that would be the biggest thing. In this book, uh, there's a lot of emotion involved, uh, just like that last picture you have of the fog coming out of his eyes at the, uh, right underneath of me. Uh, that scene is, is very emotional. I tried to bring out what he's thinking um out into 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 words and that's trying to make it as emotional for the reader to understand what he's going through 
and and everything like that. Kickstarter campaign, obviously. You are mm-hmm. funded as of this particular yep. recording. So congratulations on that. That's wonderful to see. Thank you. What have you learned from your first Kickstarter campaign to this Kickstarter campaign that you have done differently and that could help other people that are doing their own campaign? So the first one, of course, they always say have your own audience first. Uh, that's Kickstarter will help you. Uh, but if you don't have an audience, then it'll be harder to fund. Um, I've definitely just because of, I've done three now, I definitely have more of an audience and it's been slightly quote unquote easier um, in that side of things. Um, but uh, definitely do as much as you can on your own outside of it, whether that's social media, uh, like, I, like I was finding people going to cons, trying to get my name out there. Um, a lot of the, the first issue was um, other indies trying to help me out, uh, push my stuff, um, but also backing it as well uh, as a, a first time creator. So I would say um, have the audience if you can, if you can do YouTube videos or do podcasts like this, for instance, podcasts are huge, uh, have been huge trying to find an audience that I don't have already. Um I'd say that, and then the more time that I spent on Kickstarter creating my my pages, I was able to make it look more professional, uh, and just got different ideas like backgrounds. Just using a standard background for most of the like add-ons and things like that um, makes it look better. Um, different like uh, title sequence areas, like you know these are the pages, this is the the covers, things like that. It just makes it look more professional. Um, I'm using the same stuff that I had in issue two, now in issue three. Um, those kind of things have been huge. And just learning from other creators of what they've done on their Kickstarters. That's been a huge thing that everyone always talks about is Kickstarter is going to be there forever. Like it, all the ones, you know, 10 years ago are still there. You can look up to see, hey, how did this one do, do it? And why did it do so well? Um, try to take things that you can, you can learn from other people's uh, Kickstarters, and I've done a lot of that. Um, what you like is typically what everyone else is going to like too from others. So try to emulate that. Now, is there anything I, <laughs> that I've missed that you'd like to share and showcase? Those besides social media, we'll we'll talk about that at the end. We've talked about the the characters. We've talked a little bit about the story. Um, I would say just the the story right now. So like issue one, uh, I always say was like a, a world building issue. You get to learn what's going on in this world, um, how the, the government is given up. And um, now we're walled in on the town of Brooks and this how this event from the present has changed the future uh, with this regime in place, why the rebels are doing what they're doing. Issue two is the action packed issue uh, where uh, you see Hunter training and learning that he has this fog ability um, and how does he utilize it with this time warping uh, fog and then also the other rebels uh, they go out on a mission and something happens uh, some crazy action with epsilon and uh, a guy named brody it's like the weapon specialist and then the third issue is the uh, the emotional issue which we're at now uh, where he understands the fog that he has he understands the powers he hears something that's going on from the regime and tries to take on um, everyone on his own he doesn't want anybody else to get hurt. Um, someone does die in the issue, so he doesn't want anyone else after that to um, to get hurt. And he just takes on himself. And will he be successful on his own, or does he need the team? That's how we uh, the end issue three. Well, spoiler alert! Jesus, should have said that <laughs> ahead of time. Wow. <laughs> someone dies? Like really? Yep. And I I have a little teaser on the Kickstarter. So in the pages. Um, I have like page, I think page one, page two, maybe a partial page three. And then it says between these pages and I, I go to like page 16 and 17, I think is the ones I show between these pages. One of these six characters dies. Uh, which one is it? I won't tell you, of course, because I don't want to spoil, but yeah. one of them dies and you don't know why, of course. Um, so that was supposed to be a tease to get to people interested and in, in wanting to read it, too. Well, now I'm shocked. Oh. I mean, what the heck? like, <laughs> oh, bad. <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I usually, I usually have a spoiler alert at the end. I mean, geez. Do you have all twelve issues written, or are you kind of working your way towards it? I'm always curious about that. 
Yeah. So one of the exercises that I did with Scott Snyder was um, he wanted me to outline the whole thing. So I had like the broad strokes of the whole thing. And he said, uh, you know, you definitely want to at least outline, try to outline page by page, the whole thing of how you'd want to do it. And of course, things would change in the future when you completely write the whole thing, because, you know, it might be two or three years from now that that would be going on, of course, with the indie scene. Um, so do as much as you can to make sure that everything you're trying to get across is, is shown. Um, so I've outlined everything up to uh, issue 12, all the pages, at least one sentence per page, mostly of their paragraphs per page. Uh, but I have written completely full scripts up to issue five. Issue four is the, um, the arc finale, uh, the first arc. Uh, so that'll be complete. That we'll be working on as soon as I get the funds from uh, issue three's Kickstarter. I always use the, the last Kickstarter for the next book um, and make it before the Kickstarter happens. And um, issue five would be the, the next one after that. So I have at least about a year's worth of, of books uh, ready to go. And then I'll just continue that same process. When we're doing issue five, I'll have issue six written and, uh, and so forth. The fact that you, you're, you're prepared to have a completed book ready to go for people, I think that is something that is completely underutilized and not many creators either have time or capabilities to do that. I'm glad you're one of those that are able to do that. So thank you. I appreciate that as a, as a fan and a supporter of campaigns. So, Oh yeah, no, I completely understand that. Um, that was one of the big things was that some of the Indies were telling me that, you know, there are, you know, ones out there that haven't been fulfilled three years later, you know, or longer. Um, and it's just disappointing and that doesn't help the the fan base or the support. Um, and, uh, if someone's paying me, then I feel, of course, I'm obligated to give them what they've paid for. And I want it as quickly as possible. Like for this one, I have a, a date of December on there just in case something goes wrong. But I'm hoping, honestly, it'll be like late October, early November, that it'll be in people's hands. Uh, we're pretty much already done with the book. Um, so we have, I think, two pages left uh, to pencil and ink, and we're already caught up with colors on everything else. So we're good to go. I'll have about a week of, of lettering to, to do, and then that's about it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I definitely want to do it as quickly as possible. And that just gets me the, you know, a bigger fan base of understanding, Hey, I'm going to continue to do this. And that's how I'm always going to do the process. Um, yeah. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? So I would say as a writer, the first time that I realized that I could write, that it was possible to do this as an indie writer uh, was um, Robert Kirkman, um, he does, of course, The Walking Dead and everything, Invincible and all those books. Uh, but I was buying The Walking Dead Deluxe uh, because it was in color now and it's different. Uh, but in the back of the book, which I didn't realize, he had his outlines for every, um, every book that he does. So issue one had the outline, which was just this one sentence per page, kind of like how I'm doing the outlines now. And I realized that was the first step um, to be able to do this process. I realized it was that simple to at least start. I never had a starting point before that, but that was like an aha moment of, hey, you can do this too. Uh, it might take longer, of course, uh, but at least that's somewhere to begin the process. From a professional standpoint, you are, of course, a new comic creator, but you've created three issues of 12, and you're doing amazing with that. So congratulations from that professional respect. And Thank you. you're getting noticed, so that's even better. Uh, pretty soon, you'll have your own Starbucks line. So there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Do you, do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah. Uh, I mean... Of course, I'm not making tons of money on it or anything, but I'm enjoying it. Uh, people are enjoying it. Uh, people will reach out to me that I didn't know before this and saying how they want to see more. Uh, I just got my first fan art the other day of uh, Hunter, the main character, which was awesome. Um, and I, I hope to see more of that in a, a coming Facebook group uh, that I'm, I'm a part of. Um, yeah, I mean, just people enjoying what I'm writing and what I'm doing makes me feel successful. Um, can hold it he's up. actually a, a local artist and uh i've talked to him a couple of times but he's like hey you can use this however you want and i was like that's awesome i'm probably gonna make it uh you know like a 
There oh, you yeah. go. Yeah. Who's yeah. the artist? Troy uh, Dungara. Uh, and he has his own, uh, you know, comic as well. He's had a couple issues. Uh, he came out in Keen Spot actually with his, um, I think it's Slapshot is the, mm-hmm. the character. But he drew that and uh, just sent it to me. We were talking like a couple months ago and just all of a sudden he sent that uh, on Messenger and he's like, hey, you want this? I was like, yeah, of course, that's awesome. Um, so very cool. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? So I feel first when I started, uh, you know, it was a slow process with the Kickstarter because uh, no one's seen me and I haven't been on any podcasts or uh, really out there. Um, so at first failure to me was, hey, I'm not going up thousands of dollars immediately. Um, but I, I just had to have the mindset of it's going to be a slow process and just continue what I can control and um, just keep on going from there. And that's, that's how I've gotten better in each, um, each Kickstarter, and each time writing one of the books. I just always, I want to see what, what comes from it. So I just keep on pushing no matter what. And it seems to work out so far. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, maybe you're inspiring her to be a creative in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? It's a good question. Um, so I would say, so the younger generation, uh, for one with my book is my son. My son is nine years old and he is obsessed with my book. Uh, he's obsessed with this one character and he's creating a story from it, um, from this one character screaming in the first issue. It's a random dude that he called Gary and he wanted to see all the time. So I would say by me doing this, I've inspired him to want to write and to draw and he's doing it all the time now and always talking about my book. Uh, so at least with him, I've inspired him to know he can do anything that he puts his mind to. And, and that's one of my inspirations of doing this as well is showing my kids that, you know, I can do this uh, out of nowhere. You can do whatever you, you want to do in life. Um, so, so he has that inspiration and then he tells all his friends. Uh, he actually has a shirt of this random dude named Gary with his uh, screaming on it as big and bold. And every time someone says, what the heck is that? He tells them all about it. And then they get the idea of, oh, let's have some Gary stories and continues that, you know, kind of idea. Um, So I just say they see it and uh, other generations will around me will will be inspired to to do their own thing, whether it's comics or whatever. Gary, the NPC. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. And he's in each issue now. Uh, So. I did a draw in tier for issue two and issue three, and I'll continue on with that. And I had the idea of he loves Gary. So Gary is in each page. That's a draw in tier page. Um, and he has like a little mini arc of something happening in the background. So first issue, he was uh, just screaming and he was around uh, the rebels when something happened. Second issue, he's being taken by the regime and the rebels save him. And then the third issue, he's actually at the rebel base and he's putting on rebel armor. So now he is a rebel himself and he's been turned. And issue four, he's going to be in the huge fight scene um, with at the end of being a rebel and with this huge weapon that my son has um, made up. And yeah, he has tons of Gary ideas. And uh, actually I brought up Gary um, in a couple of different interviews and in, um, this one uh, podcast they had, uh, they were live and they were talking back and forth uh, in the comments. And this one guy is actually going to draw um, Amazing Spider-Man um, 300 yeah. homage. Yeah. And instead of Spider-Man, it's going to be Gary. And uh, he's actually a professional inker. So he said, if I if he gives it to me for free, would I put it in issue four uh, Kickstarter? And I said, of course. And it became this whole like thing. It's it's crazy. And my son is is loving all the Gary talk for sure. He says every podcast should just be all about Gary, nothing else. <laughs> Uh, so I, I try to bring it up every once in a while because it's, it's cool that he's he's so excited about his own character, basically. I love it. That that's great. See that that's the ingenuity of of kids. They can just simply take an idea, a concept, an image, and just run with it. It's, it's like what we were like before the world basically crushed our hopes and dreams. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let your imagination wander and just enjoy the imagination side of things, and not not care about anything else. Yeah, for sure. 
If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, man. Uh, so if my life was a comic book, the way my life is right now would be really boring because I'm a retail manager. Uh, so it would be a, a slice of life, I guess. <laughs> um, if it was what it could be and what I would enjoy uh, to read would be actually The Fog Within. So, I mean, it started out with uh, a guy running into some fog and that's kind of what I did too. Uh, so this is what I would like my life to be. I was going to be in the future and, and change the world with um, unknown power, you know. Um, but if the way it is right now, it would be the title would probably be Manager at Computer. <laughs> basically something along those lines uh because i'm a branch manager i deal with a lot of uh, logistics mm. so nothing nothing fun for sure that's why i'm writing uh, that's why i'm I'm getting the fun in this world yeah so the soundtrack uh that i would like i'm thinking like lincoln park or uh that's just in my mind just because you know the the new stuff that's out yeah. right now um star set um kind of like like a rocker uh, vibe that i would enjoy anyways not not the regular world stuff that, that's just boring i don't have a soundtrack it would be like crickets that's what it would be it would be the soundtrack for that one but that's meditation though that's completely oh yeah true <laughs> Well, I do hate to say it, Sean, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been a great talk. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this Kickstarter campaign and anything else you'd like to promote? Yes. So, of course, on social media, I am Sean Wood underscore writer on all the social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. Um, and then the Kickstarter is if you just search the fall within one through three, uh, we are there until September 20th at 9 PM on Friday. And, uh, it's, we're almost at our first stretch goal. Uh, we have one more backer until we are at our milestone of, uh, backers to do six free indie comics. Every 25, we do two issues of someone else's comic, uh, on our stuff. And then I am about $200 away from the first stretch goal, which is also a variant, a uh, partial variant cover of issue four that we've already created, Hunter versus Damon uh, Magnet, which is really cool. Um, so find us there. Uh, find me on social media. I'm willing to talk to anybody about anything, my book or anything nerd. I'm up for it. So just find me everywhere. So when are we getting the Gary Magnet? So Gary, the original face that my son became obsessed with was my original sticker. Huh? So it is a in the sticker pack for issues one through three for five bucks. Um, people didn't realize what it was when I first made the sticker. And I didn't actually put it out on the Kickstarter. I made it for like creators and other people that's helped me. And I put like a note on the back saying, hey, thanks for doing this. Here's a sticker to remember me by. And no idea what it was. Uh, they just thought it was funny. And um yeah, so there's there's more Gary stuff in the future, though, for sure. <laughs> well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You could, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Website's going through complete revamp because, you know, I'm only one person. Give me a break. It's been 15 years, for God's sake. So go to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash tgtmedia. That's always updated. The podcast is available on any podcast platform where you get your podcasts, search Two Geeks Talking. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.